It's Wednesday, January 25th, 2017, and this is KBIA's Views of the News. Our weekly roundtable on media behaviors comes to you from the Futures Lab studio at the Reynolds Journalism Institute. I'm Amy Simons, and here with me are my colleagues Mike McKean and Ernest Perry. On our program this week, hundreds of thousands of women marched in D.C., across America and around the world. But for journalists, where is the line between activism and professionalism? We've been talking about fake news and its role in the election for many months, but maybe it wasn't as influential as we once thought. We'll talk about a study that looked at that exactly. And we've got something slightly less political I wanna ask these guys about. This year's Oscar nominations, coming off of last year's Oscars So White, we'll look at who it is that Hollywood is recognizing this year. There's a lot more that hopefully we'll get to as well, but we're going to start with alternative facts. First it was fake news, now it seems the world is talking about alternative facts. What are those exactly? Well, take a listen to this. Trump advisor Kellyanne Conway on Meet the Press Sunday talking about how Press Secretary Sean Spicer described the crowds at Friday's inauguration. And you did not answer the question. I did you answer could, no, your you question. No, you did not. You did yes, not answer did. the question of why the president asked the White House press secretary to come out in front of the podium for the first time and utter a falsehood. Why did he do that? It undermines the credibility of the entire White House press office no, it on doesn't. day don't one. Be so, don't be so overly dramatic about it, Chuck. What it, it, you're saying it's a falsehood, and they're giving Sean Spicer, our press secretary, gave alternative facts to that. But the point remains Wait a minute. Alternative that facts? There's... Alternative facts, four of the five facts he uttered. The hey, one Chuck, thing he why, got hey, right Chuck. was Zeke Miller. Four of the five facts he uttered were just not true. Look, alternative facts are not facts. They're falsehoods. So, Ernest, you tell me that you saw this live on Sunday morning, and your first thought was, Chuck Todd's head is about to explode. It's, right. Well, my head was about to explode as I was sitting there watching it, and I kept going like, alternative facts? What? I mean, the next question out of his mouth should, should be, explain that. Define alternative facts. Either it happened or it didn't happen. He was right or he was wrong. So, I mean, I think I think Chuck Todd was, was had had all the ammunition he needed to go after her at that point. So you're saying it was a missed opportunity for him? It was a missed opportunity for both of them. It was a missed opportunity for him to find out exactly what alternative facts means. It was a missed opportunity for her to basically straighten the whole situation out and say, hey, you know, maybe we should have done this, so we should have talked about something else. But I think when Donald Trump went down the road to basically criticize the media for them c covering the inauguration and the way that they covered it just made the whole thing turn into a circus, pretty much. I don't know if this is going to be helpful or not. And this whole business about alternative facts is just a little like going down the rabbit hole. But I don't think that the, the one thing that everybody quoted Sean Spicer on as being an alternative fact was actually that. I mean, he said this was the largest audience ever to witness an inauguration, period, both in person and around the globe. And it's that last little bit. It's not that it's an alternative fact. It's an unverifiable yeah, claim. Yeah. We don't know what happened all around the world with previous inaugurations and we never will know an alternative fact is something like if the president says you know uh, it was the coldest day on record in Minneapolis and a scientist says it's the hottest year on record on earth those are both facts but they're aimed at trying to convince you of different sides of a political argument and I think we're gonna get plenty of those from the White House oh, too. I, I think so too and, and, I, and I agree with you totally that this this is basically going down a rabbit hole and I think Trump's plan is pretty much the, the, the same plan that he had during the campaign, which is I am going to throw these little bits out there to keep the media occupied while I'm doing what I want to do it's over deflection. here. It's, 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 it's deflecting away from all the other things that he's that he's doing. I mean, they're paying attention to what, what Kellyanne Conway is saying here about alternative facts when they should be paying attention to what are his nominees for cabinet positions saying in those hearings? And are they e either going along with what Trump said in the campaign and they're going to do that, or are they are they going to do something that, that's that's totally different? 
I wish they would concentrate more on that. Yeah, I want to agree with that, too, because I think that what Trump was doing was not going off message or Sean Spicer going no. off message. That was the that first is the reaction. message. No, that was the first <laughs> reaction, though, of the press. And my first reaction, you know, just kind of using the old standard way of looking at things. Why is he stepping on his message? I don't think he was. I think that this president and his people are out there deliberately trying to deflect us away, that chaos is the strategy. Oh, I, I think you're absolutely right. And we are falling for it because if you can go to you go to all those Sunday morning talk shows that every single one of them were talk, was talking to Kellyanne Conway about how many people showed up at the inauguration how many people watched it on television and I'm sitting there going like whoa wait a minute Congress just voted to gut the Affordable Care Act that's the story that should should be the topic of conversation on the talk shows, not how many people actually showed up for the for the election. I mean, they were. I mean, for the inauguration, yeah, they right. were talking about that instead of how many people showed up for the huge march that happened on Saturday. They they talked a little bit about that and they went straight back to the def deflection that Donald Trump had threw out there. There are some journalistic issues that we do need to keep talking mm -hmm. about. I mean, whether it's fake news or falsehoods, or if you want to use the word lie to talk about what the president said. I'll use that lie. Say. Okay. But I will say We're that come it's, back to that in just it's a more important for journalists to realize that the response to what the White House is doing right now is to do more original reporting and less focus on you know parsing the words every day on every statement. I, th I think you're absolutely right. There so. needs to be more reporting and less talking to each other about what's going on. It's sort of like we're still in that journalism echo chamber where we're talking to each other about what the president said instead of going out and doing reporting and reporting stories that people care about. Okay, so let's back it up to that lie because and the use of the word lie. Um, the New York Times used the word lie on the front page earlier this week. And this morning on NPR on Morning Edition, there were some pretty lengthy segments about how and why NPR is going to try to steer clear of using that word. I, I understand NPR's position. So Mary Louise Kelly was talking about this and she basically said, we can never see inside the president's brain. The so intent we, is so we don't know it was his intent to deceive. And so that's what a lie is. Okay, on one level, I buy that. But I do think that journalists can infer from the timing of those statements. You say one thing, and then a few days later, you say another thing. Or you say something that's not true, and it's around trying to influence a policy decision. I think you can say that's an intent to deceive. Oh, no, I, I, I totally agree with you. I mean, I think he, he, he has shown over the course, not only of the campaign, but over his career that he is willing to throw what he considers to be facts, or if you want to use Kellyanne Conway's alternative facts out there that don't match the, the what the actual facts are. They don't match the truth. And when that happens, I think journalists should be responsible and basically say, look, I'm sorry, Mr. President, but what you're saying is false because the actual facts state this. But again, be, to be more. I know it's a political thing. I but, but, but to be more effective, and I think we both agree on this, is that instead of you know showing your anger in print or on the air or trying to get even in some way, do something positive. I I love what. ProPublica did, and you've got a link to it mm -hmm. on the Lynx blog. They basically put together a long story about how to leak materials to us without getting caught, doing it anonymously. <laughs> yeah, I saw that. That's great. Uh, that's what journalists need yeah. to do: more reporting with more documents, with more. And no, I agree. In other words, when 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 he when he or someone in his administration makes a, makes a comment or says something that a journalist knows they can't back up with facts. We need to state that and then we need to put the facts out there so that the public can see it for themselves. And I should mention the Associated Press has something similar using um, untraceable browsers using Tor that, that right. ProPublica does. Well, we've wondered what Trump and his inner circle's relationship would be with reporters. Here's one thing we hadn't really considered. Yesterday afternoon, reports that employees at the Department of Health and Human Services, the Environmental Protection Agency, and the USDA were told to cease communications with members of Congress and with the media. A source at the USDA, which runs social service programs such as the Supplemental Nutrition Program and WIC, told the Huffington Post that they were told to stop posting to social media, updating its website, or to send public messages, including press releases, 
until further notice. Talk about a chilling effect. Well, this is extended. This is extended now to the EPA and to scientists at, at CDC and other mm -hmm. places. This is, to me, this sort of goes against, you know, Republican and to a certain extent Democratic, you know, you know what they claim to believe in, which is transparency. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're basically telling government workers not to tell the public what they're doing and they're being paid by the taxpayers. I mean, I, it, it, it just befuddles me. And I, I understand that they're trying to make sure that they get their people in place and, and this sort of thing. But Isn't that what the transition is for? Exactly, exactly. But you don't withhold information because you're going through a transition. I don't agree with what's being done, but I would say taking it by itself, mm -hmm. it's not unusual. Presidents, Democrat and Republican before, trying to manage the message, especially when they're transitioning their people into office. But, but that, you can't this is take not, it by itself. Yeah, but this is not managing the message. This is basically saying nobody talk. Now that's, that's a whole lot different than saying... We would like it before you do this to let but us. But I mean, whether that's stated publicly and memos are leaked to the press, presidents come in and they want to make sure that the message is managed. They want to make sure nobody's out there saying anything online or in print that's different until they know who their people are. But the I problem, would, the problem is, is that we can't take this in isolation. We have to take this in consideration with what they're doing at the White House press corps, what they're doing with how they put out fake news or alternative facts or whatever you want to call it. It's part of a larger piece that's really disturbing. But you know what it also says to me is that you have a significant number of federal employees who are who are not happy with their current boss. Mm -hmm. They're not happy with the current administration and they're willing to let the public know certain things that, you know, maybe the Trump administration doesn't want to, to have out there. And I think this may be one of them. Another thing that was kind of interesting to me about this, um, somebody who I know who I used to work with who does a lot of data and investigative work for WBEZ in Chicago had posted something on Facebook yesterday, kind of, and this was before this happened, suggesting that we wait to be outraged for the things that really matter. And this is somebody who files, f files for Freedom of Information Act requests basically for a living. And... By the end of the day, I started thinking, you know, as someone who files Freedom of Information Act requests for a living, it looks like you got a whole lot of them to go file right here. Right, right. And a lot and a, and a, a huge reason to be outraged. This, right. This became the reason yeah, right yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I agree. I agree. I just think that this is one of those issues that I hope that they lift this ban pretty soon, because if not, it's going to be... Um, J journalists are going to be literally at war with, well, with and, FOIA. And not, if journalists at war with FOIA, and then you have to wonder, too, what happens with the Trump administration's relationship with Congress uh, in, on both sides of the aisle, because Congress is also yeah. part of this ban. I agree with you that it's bad. I agree that it could lead to a war with journalists, but I also believe that you can never tamp down on leaks. There are plenty of people That's in true. the federal sure. government in every agency, and if this policy remains in place, there's going to be just that much more incentive for them to come out and tell us what's really going on. I agree. On. I agree. Okay, well, Saturday's women's marches, the main event in D.C. and the sister marches across the country, drew a few million people fighting for human rights causes believed to be threatened in a Trump presidency. I'll admit there was a part of me sitting at home watching on my couch wondering if I should be out there, but I know the answer is no. As an old school journalist and one who believes that transparency is important, but that objectivity is more important, that means I gave up my right to be publicly political a long time ago. It's a fine line for a lot of journalists, and there are a lot of them who I know who were in D.C. and in New York and in Chicago and even here in Columbia holding signs and marching on Saturday. And that's their choice until it isn't. Management at several news outlets issued memos to staffers reminding them of their ethical obligations to stay home. NPR gave specific instructions to employees on how to act while being out there and covering the march. I'm going to say in some cases, I saw former students of mine uh, who were out there working on the job wearing the pink pussy hats, and that really made me uncomfortable. 
I'm like you, Amy. I'm kind of old school where, where this comes into play. I understand that there are difference of opinion about whether we just need to be transparent and that's enough. I don't believe so. I mean, I think perception of bias is just as important. I mean, NPR kind of got it right in what they were telling their employees. They said, we can't keep the public's trust if we aren't seen as independent and we risk our reputation if it looks like we're not impartial. So you can be impartial, maybe, maybe not. Maybe you can be unbiased and still be out there walking in a protest march or giving money to a candidate, but you create an impression that your news organization is not. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm with the two of you. I'm also old school. And We're I, old funny I, yeah, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> you know, I just, I, I have a problem with journalists being engaged in protest movements. That's not what we do. It does hurt our, 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 uh, our independence, uh, because if we're supposed to be be covering the totality of a story, then we can't look at, uh, be seen by either side or, or any of the sides as being partial to one or the other. So when we show up at those marches as participants, that sort of takes away our ability to be that independent voice. I can understand the argument that if your news organization or you as a journalist make your money by positioning yourself as partisan or opinionated or whatever, okay, then maybe you seem even more authentic by being out there on the front lines. But I hope there's still an audience for the kind of journalism we're talking about. One of the memos that was put out there that has people talking was from the San Francisco Chronicle. And this went to the entire newsroom, including copy editors, sports reporters, people who would very rarely, if ever, be involved in political reporting. And it reminded employees that participation in an event like this one would not only be a violation of the newsroom's ethical policy, but it could be a potentially fireable offense. And people who received this memo really felt put out because they felt it was hypocritical that a newspaper that would encourage them to participate in its gay pride parade float each summer would tell them that they can't participate in this. Well, that is an issue. I mean, that, but I mean, when you when you're when you're talking about a huge event like uh, uh, like, like like gay pride or say the uh, an MLK, MLK mm-hmm. marches which we we just had here a, a week or so ago, that's different as opposed to being involved in a protest march where you are protesting the actions of either the government or or some other entity. Those are those are two totally different things, but. As, as news organizations, you need to spell that out in your code of conduct, in the contracts that you have with your employees, so that they know, here, here's what our expectations are if you're going to be an employee. Here. So how would you explain that to somebody who's confused and doesn't see the delineation between the two types? One is a community event, one is a protest? That's one way of doing it. And you need to define what those are in in that statement. So I'm not sure there is a distinction. I mean, I, I, I think when you say, well, if you allow us to walk under the company banner in the gay pride parade, we should be allowed to be in the women's march. OK, I will grant from my perspective, at mm-hmm. least, that gay rights and women's rights are kind of settled in most people's minds. But still, I don't think the answer is that you can do one, you can do the other. I'm not sure the San Francisco Chronicles reporters, even if gay rights is sort of a settled issue, especially in their city, that they should be out there in a, taking part in a parade as journalists. Well, I mean, I, I, I go along. I, I agree with what you're saying. What the part that the point that I want to make is that I think the the the, the news organization needs to state that right. up front in its policies so that reporters, editors, copy editors, whoever they know going in, this is what's acceptable and this is not. Okay, well, for all of the talk that we've had in the past few months about fake news and the influence that it had on the election, a study coming out of Stanford and New York universities shows that may not be so much the case. I know you probably haven't had a chance to read the entire study yet. If somebody wants to, the full thing is on our links blog. But based on the abstract and and a little bit of what you've read, what are they finding here? Well, to be honest with you, I, I, I looked over some of this, yeah. but I'm not surprised. I mean, okay. they, what you know, what they're what they're finding is that you know, yes, there were there were various attempts at fake news. Some some you know, you have some who are blaming the Russians for for some of it. You have uh, various partisan uh, operations that were responsible for putting it out there. But I, but I think overall, the election went the way it was. It went because this is what. That, that seg- the segment of the population, this is what they wanted. They wanted 
Donald Trump as change. president. Yeah. They wanted change. And yes, Hillary Clinton won th had, had three million more votes than Donald Trump. She just didn't have them in the right places. Mm -hmm. okay. I skimmed it. I didn't read every bit of it. But I will say that, one, I mean, the conclusion they drew that they found no independent effect of fake news on whether somebody was going to vote for Trump instead of Hillary right, Clinton. Right. And I think that's kind of what I believed. But I will say what really makes this study useful is that these social scientists were very rigorous in how they did this. They conducted a survey and there were problems with surveys, but they tried to correct them. They defined what fake news was very clearly. You may not agree with their definition, but they made a very uh, good definition that anybody could e agree or disagree with. And they b based their study on a lot of theory and research that had gone before. So when they come up with their conclusions, they're not just based on supposition or opinion or the heat of the moment. And so I do think that people should take a look at it, at least from the standpoint of figuring out whether or not they think there's a logical case to be made one way or the other. I mean, I also think that that anyone who, who looks at the analytics of elections, the, the polling and that sort of thing, should definitely take a look at this because it will give them some perspective about how how news, mm -hmm. not just fake news, but how, how news and information in general that is presented to the public, what kind of an impact that, that does that have on, on the way in which they, people make determinations on how they're going to vote? And I like the fact, like with all good social science research, they spell out the deficiencies in the study, mm -hmm. the things we can't know or right. the assumptions we had to make. One of them, for example, being that we have to assume that the impact of these fake news stories would be the same for all stories for all voters. Well, probably that's not true, right. but at least they laid it out there so that you know what they could prove and what they couldn't prove. So let's talk about the future of the corporation of uh, corporation for public broadcasting. It's called that for a reason. It's public. It supports public media. But now they're with Republicans in control of the White House and both chambers of Congress. Its funding is in jeopardy again. There's talk about privatizing it. How would that work? Well, I'm not sure. How, they've talked about this. It comes going up going all the way with back the change to, of every yeah, administration. Yeah, change of every administration, and I'm not sure how that's going to work. I yeah. mean, it, to me, it's one of those things where they say, okay, well, you know, they would turn it over to a private corporation and let them determine, you know, how they're going to run it. Well, th that's already happening to a certain extent with with the board that they have. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the question becomes, how much public funding are they getting? How much is the government uh, 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 providing for them? And whether or not the, the government wants to continue to do that. And the Republicans are saying, no, we don't want to continue to do that. And they've been saying that for a while. So now here we are at that point again, whether or not the, the Congress has the stomach to send a bill to the president for his signature, that's what I'm waiting for. Until I see that, then I think we're just going down that same rabbit hole again. Yeah. Well, so a caveat, first of all, our primary means of reaching our audience is through a public media outlet. Right. I've been working for one for 30 years. I believe in public media, so but I would I. have to say- We wouldn't be sitting at this table if we didn't. I do yeah. think there is an argument to be made for privatization. The problem is, is that taking away federal subsidies from public media outlets would have differential impacts. Exactly. In some very poor states yeah. or stations that don't have a big base of support, it could be devastating. Places like here, KBIA has a very loyal audience audience that produces a lot of money to fund it, probably down the road some, it could be self-sufficient. So it's hard to know what the real impact would be over but I time. Think, but I think part of this argument goes goes directly at the elite media within uh, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, those, those big stations that would probably survive. Mm -hmm. This is going to hurt the ones who are in, believe it or not, those rural markets who are the ones that are going to be impacted. Okay. Well, before we go, I want to bring up something non-political. Well, maybe it's non-political. It depends how you look at it. The Oscar nominations, those came out yesterday, and they were a bit different than last year. Take a listen. Actress in a supporting role. Viola Davis in Fences. Naomi Harris in Moonlight. Nicole Kidman in Lion. Octavia Spencer in Hidden Figures. And... Michelle Williams in Manchester by the Sea. Three of those women, black women, Denzel Washington is nominated, Ruth Nega, Anna DeVernay, Dev Patel, different makeup from last year. 
Uh, to be expected with the with the huge uh, backlash that came after last year's Oscars, I, I, this does not surprise me. I, you could see it coming in the types of movies that that, that came out during Oscar season. The the caliber of of, of actors and actresses in in, in that in, in that across the board, I, I'm not surprised at all. I would say the one caveat to that mm -hmm. is that. In many of these movies, these were these were movies uh, about black people and Fences, black people's experiences. Figures. So, so the, the 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 actors fit into into those those certain genres, and so you you're gonna see it for that reason. What what I want to see next is when you see these actors in multifaceted uh, film roles. Uh, that aren't connected to a, a African American historical or a, a Latino uh, historical event. Yeah, I mean, I, it's an improvement from last year, but then just about anything would be, right? <laughs> uh, I haven't seen any of the nominees. Yeah, I have a lot yet. of movies to go see in the next uh, few no, weeks. I do too. And so I can't pass judgment on the acting or, or the stories, really. I will say there's one other thing that comes out besides the fact that there's a bit more diversity, depending on how you want to define it, this year. And that's that Hollywood also does something the same every year, no matter how much they change in one area or another. Anytime there's a movie that's about Hollywood, the Academy loves the movie La La Land getting all these nominations. Yeah. They're very self-referential in Hollywood. No, I agree with you. I mean, and, and, and I've, I've talked to several people who've seen La La Land. They think it's a, they think it's a great movie. They loved it. Some of them would say, I'm not sure it's deserving of this many nominations. Uh, and a lot of it is, it, they think it's coming because it's a musical mm -hmm. and it, it, it sort of fits into something that's different that you haven't seen from Hollywood in a while. But I do agree with, with uh, Mike, whenever it's about Hollywood, it's going to get a, a lot of publicity. So the diversity that we saw yesterday in the nominations, does it matter if the diverse nominees don't win? Oh, it's going to matter. Because if they if there aren't some wins in there, then we're we're going to be back on back talking about then that this. that Monday after it becomes Oscar exactly. so white again. Yes, yes it does. Yes it does. I would be amazed if there aren't a few wins. Yeah. I mean, given the number of nominations and because they added so many new voting members from a more diverse pool of actors and directors and writers. And when you think about the performances uh, and the then the, the those who are. <laughs> who are uh, uh, nominated. I mean, Denzel Washington, Viola Davis, I mean, these are huge actors. Uh, Denzel, who has won an Oscar before, mm -hmm. so right. it's it's not like, you know. It's not like they're nobodies, exactly, they just kind of exactly. trotted out for the purpose exactly. of giving a nomination. Yes, I mean, you know, let, let's, let's, let's not talk about their, their race, let's talk about their body of work okay. and, and what they've done. They they would be very deserving of the award. Yeah, and I, and I would say too, Anna DuVernay, setting herself apart too as a director as well, putting herself in a category with some of the others who with, with are. The, with, the docu it, with the documentary, I mean, which, which is powerful. It is very, a very powerful. powerful and that's on Netflix, too, yes, if anybody yes. wanted to see that at that point. Well, we are just about out of time for this week. I'd like to thank you for spending the last half hour with us. You can read more about the topics we talked about today, including that tip on how you can leak information to ProPublica if you so choose. Those links are all on our links blog under the Programs tab at kbia.org. We also invite you to like us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter. Our handle there is at views on KBIA. These are all great ways to watch and listen to our program again. You can leave us comments or questions, see previews of what we'll be talking about next week, and more. Our thanks to RJI's Travis McMillan for directing today's show and to Kyle Felling for handling the audio for us today. Travis Meyer is our brand new associate producer. Good to have him on board. I'm Amy Simons. Be sure to join us again next week when we're back with you for another edition of Views of the News.